Welcome. Welcome. And Kreisel. Kreisel e Tavi Tan. Tavad Tan. <laughs> Where we set the sheep on fire. Sheep is on fire. The sheep is on fire. Yeah, well, welcome. We're on uh, Tavad Tan in the castle. It's Monday. And... Uh, we are not live. We are not live. Why are we not live? Uh, YouTube seems to be down. That's unusual, though. I know. I don't know why it's about. What's all that about? I'm not sure. You know. So we're pre-recording the show, and we will upload it when YouTube's back up. When it's on, and you'll be able to get it after we've finished. Because we'll upload it. Yeah. So how have you been keeping? You know, it's been a tough week, but uh, we don't have to go into that. But yeah, it's been a tough week. What about yourself? Yeah, it's been a it's been a really hard week. Yeah, it's been a you know walks, reflections, and um, not knowing how to handle things and deal with things or just uh, sometimes it's, it's good just to have a rest you know isn't it for sure so we have a guest who's just turned up this is uh, Neil Cocker Neil Cocker come outside there and uh, this is your legend <laughs> the legend <laughs> um, <laughs> staying super safe before Christmas for my good mom. boy good boy good. that's your uh, seat there that's your mic there and we're, we're just to let you know we're not live we've had a bit of a technical issue <laughs> so we're pre-recording to upload when we're done as uh, live youtube is actually down which we gmail's down yeah yeah the, whole, the whole google infrastructure's uh, gone wow what's yeah. happened there any ideas i don't know i've just been looking into it myself because i've been trying to send emails and all our systems are run off google so oh shit yeah that's that's huge, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, YouTube's down, Google, uh, gmail's down. That's mad, yeah. isn't it? All at once. All at once, yeah. Basically everything that they run, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, because nice. we, we always go on YouTube Live every Monday, so, uh, yeah, that's quite confusing. <laughs> Hopefully we'll come back. <laughs> Neil Cocker, live. <laughs> Not live. <laughs> as live. Yeah. As, as live. Yeah, in the living flesh. <laughs> so, Neil, yeah, we just pulled you in from uh, from having a coffee there. Um, yeah, if you're up for it, we'll just uh, ask you a few laid-back questions about what you're up to in Yeah, Paris. sure. Um, do you want to kick off, Ninja, or shall I? Yeah. Neil, right, was in an era and in a time where not much was being expressed the way that we wanted it to be expressed, especially, uh, you know, there was a lot of bands and uh, independent labels started to surface, but a, a, a main one which uh, touched me was uh, Plastic Raygun. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad, man. That's uh, that's nice to hear. And uh, you you were the found, founder. Yeah, one of them. There was a, there was a handful of us. We were a little sort of crew, a little collective to begin with. Uh, yeah, and it just kind of grew from there. Basically, the reason we set it up was because the kind of music that we were producing in the early days wasn't good enough for anyone else to release. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> everyone was turning our music down. So we were like, oh, well, we'll release it ourselves. Why and was that? Why was that you think? I don't know, I think we were just naive and young and stupid and we didn't know what we were doing. This back in the late 90s, right? So also the like the, the, the access to information, you know, Cardiff was still a small place. We were very disconnected from London and where all the sort of professional stuff was happening. And so we kind of felt a little bit disconnected. Um, and we managed to, we got better. That's, that was it. We just had to get better on our own. Um, and then we had some talented people working with us who were producing good music. And then over the course of a year or two, like we found that actually the stuff we were doing because we were out of London and because we weren't in that little bubble where everyone was having their own you know that little click yeah yeah that little click actually what we were doing was slightly different and yeah. people were like oh right no we get it now so I remember the first time uh, Matt my DJ partner and I went to DJ at a proper big club in London this would have been maybe 99 we'd have been like 20 Three twenty-four. Yeah, 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 exactly. 19, 19, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> man. Um, and we went there, and we just played a really 
what would have been considered quite an uncool set. Right, but it was a bit of a party set. So we, we, we basically got asked to do the second room. There's a club called Heavenly Jukebox. Heavenly Juke. Yeah, Heavenly Jukebox. Box. Yeah, so Heavenly Jukebox was like, uh, it was this big sort of club in this sort of big beat, breakbeat scene, and it was considered like this uh, um, bit of a mecca for the kind of stuff we were doing. And uh, yeah, we, we went along, but because we weren't playing the same records that everyone in London had been playing for the last six months, we came with a totally different, fresh attitude and by accident, completely rocked it. Like, it was just like, you know, and they instantly asked us to come back and be like residents, and, but because we came with this fresh attitude of not being, and I think that's different now because you can plug into London from here, right? Through yeah, Boiler Room yeah, or whatever you yeah. want, you know, you can watch what all the top DJs are playing. But back in 99, it was like, unless you lived in London, you didn't know what was going on in London. Precisely, yeah. Yeah. apart from Radio One in it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm saying, a lot of people would just, follow what was out there yeah being out there would mean you know what was like they would class as as, as mainstream and stuff and but still people were hearing other things which were quite attractive to them yeah like, i think what really what was really interesting to me when i when we first started touring america would have which been like the early 2000s you went to the states yeah a couple of times yeah oh, went there quite, quite a few times um so I yeah find that. it was really interesting like because Breakbeat, as we were doing then, was a bit of a, a... Like, America, because it's so big, it's got pockets, right? So you get little areas where certain... You know, like, you'd be a handful of states where you can go... So we played a lot in the southeast, a lot in the west coast, uh, but not a lot in the northeast. So we didn't really do anything in New York or whatever, just because that was a very housey scene, like up in New York, but there yeah. wasn't much Breakbeat going on. Mm -hmm. But what was really interesting, when we were touring through some of the smaller places, like we were playing in South Carolina or whatever... And you forget how lucky we are in the UK in terms of music. Yeah. Because, you know, all of us kids growing up in the 70s, 80s, whatever, right? We could have, t we, you know, Radio 1's very commercial during the daytime. But in the evening, we could have turned on and heard John Peel playing sort of Gabba next to folk music. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. like, if you're, if you're a kid in, um, in outside of a major, major city in America, pre-internet, you had nothing. Unless you had a college station in town... Mm -hmm. Like wherever you were, whether you lived jo Land's End, John O'Groats, in the UK, you could tune into Radio 1 after, like, say, 9 o'clock, and you could hear drum and bass, you could yeah. hear, you know, or whatever was kind of fresh and new. We were very lucky. Yeah. Like, Radio 1 is, is a bit of a different beast now, but back then it was like that little window of, like, actually, and American kids, if you lived in, like, Nowheresville, Arizona, you had nothing. Well, like, you, you know, you literally could, because pre-internet, no student radio... Like, so how the hell are you going to... So of course you grow up voting for Trump and listen to, to sort of sort of country music because yeah. that's all you know. You've that's got nothing you know. to... And hope, you know, the internet hopefully op opens <coughs> people's minds a little bit, but also it's polarised things a little bit as well, you know, which is why we've got Brexit and Trump, you know. So. <laughs> what, was it, what was it like in America then when you went to these places pre-internet that had never experienced anything like... Their local, other than their local music, you, you know what it was. It was it relied on really good, passionate promoters who'd managed to find that stuff. So they were buying vinyl from their local stores. So they were buying from places like Catapult, yeah, and they were building their own little scene. So right. sometimes we yeah. play in the smaller places. We played in like where did we play? Like, God, somewhere in like South Carolina, Charlottesville, maybe mm -hmm. like a small, small city, small town that really shouldn't have had any kind of dance culture. But like just one promoter there had gone, you know what? I'm just going to start building this, and it was like the kind of thing they build from the middle floor of the uh, club people back, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then they build it and build it, and then all of a sudden they're in like a bigger room and a bigger room, and they built their own little scene, you know. So, um, so we're sometimes reliant on those. So sometimes they'd be like, you know, you go and play to 50 people, but they would the entire 50 people within a two-hour drive. Yeah who listen to that type of music. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, we once played in Atlanta, and we met these guys, and one of whom I'm still a mate with, actually. Him and his mates had driven 14 hours <laughs> to come and see come us. Come and see the Because they, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. They, but it was like this big night of other... There was, it wasn't just us, but it was yeah. like, there's this big night of breakbeat. And three lads taking it in turn driving non-stop for 14 hours, wow. because where they lived in the middle of nowhere... They didn't have access to a breakbeat night. You know, if they were lucky, there was some line dancing going on or whatever. You know? so, <laughs> so, yeah, so they, they drove like 14 hours in shifts to get there, slept in their car, drove home. Well, you know, that's why I would put 
put my phone on mute. Oh, that's you. Yeah, sorry. I was just panicking. I thought it was just yeah, going to play. No, it's just, yeah, it's just uh, my, uh, <laughs> my business partners. Yeah, um, yeah, it was Castle Arcade. I was going to go in. Uh, I think it was the there was a modelling uh, agent there or something, and and I went into the violin shop. Oh right. And then I accidentally went into uh, another place and I opened the door and I think I seen you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. might have been possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were up on the balcony. And I, yeah, and I said on the balcony. Yeah, and I said, um, "What's this?" What's <laughs> I said, "What's I was this?" Like, I don't know. Really, what is it, Ninja? We don't know either. <laughs> And then he says, oh, a record label. Yeah, 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 yeah. right, yeah. And and to be like, honest, it's really interesting. Shocked. Looking back, we didn't know what we were doing anyway. It was like, it was, you know, typical kind of bunch of guys in their 20s making it up as they go along. Yeah, because I met, I met a guy, I think it was a, he was a drummer. He was a plastic ray gun and he was playing, it was like a, a jazz. Okay. A, a jazzy, jazz funk. Oh, okay. It was, and I'm not sure. I think it could have been from North Wales. Oh, God, I don't know. We, we used to hang around with so many people. And like I say, in the you early days, it was, it was, it, the plastic it was a little bit of a collective. Like, they were, in the early days, before we kind of formalised it, before there was like a limited company and a release schedule and stuff, it was just like, hey, whoever wants to be involved can be involved. Like, if you want to make music, send us stuff. And, and then after a while, we were like, oh, no, we've got to do tax returns and shit. <laughs> so it's kind of like we had to put, like, directorships in place and it kind of got a bit serious and pay wages and, uh, yeah. Because I, I was looking for a label at that time as well. I wasn't quite sure because mm. uh, this is when I was uh, doing the, my first album, I Blessed the Day I Found You, mm. where I had all this passion. And I was I re, re, mo, the, the main thing I was passionate about was the creativity, you know? Um uh, promoting creativity because I, I, I found there was a, a lot of like great musicians and people who were like good at poetry and all these mm. kind of things it was a shock to me yeah 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 because you know I'd left states and I'd come here you know I'd gone back to Birmingham and uh, gave up my my house I was staying in and came all the way down to Wales on a train with uh, two suitcases yeah, yeah and I was staying at Neville Street across the road from the conservative Riverside Conservative. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. Which was bombed in the war. Right, wow. As people kept telling me on the street, <laughs> do you wow. know that was bombed? In the war, in wow. The war. And I remember being upstairs in a flat there, hearing um, a Shirley Bassey type of voice sc screaming out. Right. And I thought, that's amazing. Where's that coming from? And it was the conservative club. The, you know, they have a, a little dance and shake up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, <laughs> some great singers and stuff so and, yeah some club singer style yeah, yeah club singer style so and i knew there was a, like a, a lot of talent but there wasn't didn't seem to be that many channels for the talent apart from you know like what i'd find out by going to welsh club yeah 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 because welsh club was like like one of the main places where it would yeah for I me it was like so many different types of music in welsh club it was it was the only it, for me it felt like the only place very in the very early days where you could go and listen to something that that was left of centre that in terms of like dance culture, dance music culture, or electronic music culture that wasn't house music. Yeah. Like you had the Emporium for all the sort of uh, handbags and stuff, but like <laughs> if you wanted to listen to drum and bass, hip hop, breakbeat, anything that was left of centre or just wasn't mainstream back then, yeah, it was like Club Rubac was the only only place to go, right? Yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. And then there's a couple of places, you know, obviously you started promoting events and there were a few little, un, you know, a, a bunch of us started to find little underground places where you could put stuff on. But yeah, back in very late 90s, there was not really a lot going on in terms of venues that you could use. Yeah. We used to, I've just found, uh, someone sent me a flyer, a photo of a flyer the other day from um, Robert's Emporium. Do you remember on Salisbury Road? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the scouts oh, yeah. or whatever. Scouts yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We used to, uh, yeah, we used to uh, run some sort of dodgy little events up there, and it was, they were they were great. I that mean, was such a good space. You right? couldn't get away with them now, no. like in terms of, but like you know, uh, I remember we used to we used to run some slightly, um, uh, let's say, outside of the scope of uh, <laughs> the, the law of what is allowed. Allowed, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I went behind the bar. Up there. You were working, you weren't you? Yeah, behind the bar. Yeah. What, what, yeah, one time and I had to wear leather trousers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we used to often go, I think there was a, there were fetish nights the nights before we That's used to, right, yeah. yeah, so yeah. there was all sorts of stuff, uh, all sorts of paraphernalia left behind, like we'd find. Because <laughs> I was sent into a room which had been made into a sauna room. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Uh, to, to, uh, to, to give 
drinks out which have been ordered and all I seen in there was naked people. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, it was pretty weird. It good times. Good times. Good times. <laughs> it's a shame though because that there is a, there is a sense that that stuff is like that underground stuff, whether it's the club night stuff or the fetish night stuff, that's where culture is made. It's yeah. on the fringes of society, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the dressing. The dressing was amazing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, the creativity of yeah. dressing and, and uh, stuff like stuff like that. So with the uh, label, could I ask, because obviously you yeah, started sure. out as a bunch of mates mm -hmm. having fun. Could you like maybe share some of the secrets on taking it to the level where you're touring America, having a big release schedule, <sighs> yeah, and, and having hits, I guess, you know? To I, be I, honest, it was... I'd like to say there was some strategy and plan there. A lot of it was just luck. Like you often hear about these things of like, you know, when you look back at the times of uh, the factory records in Manchester, or you know, you saw the Liverpool movement back in the sixties or seventies. And I'm obviously not for a second suggesting we're anything comparable to that, but like, you often just find if you're lucky to find a small group of people doing good stuff at the same time. Yeah they kind of magnify each other. Right. And I think a lot of it was just that. In fact, I would argue that we, if we'd have had half a brain, or just we'd been a bit more mature, a bit wise, a bit older, we could have done a lot more. Right. You know, I actually sometimes kick myself and think, you know what, we had a really golden opportunity. Like we never, we made a living, but it was like a living, do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, um, and you know what, it was much more of a lifestyle business. And the thing is also, you know, we I, I was going off and playing in, I know Berlin and uh, Prague or something on Friday and Saturday night, or Nottingham and Manchester, yeah. and then coming back on Monday, and I was useless until Wednesday, yeah. and then you've got to try and fit a week's worth of like actual work of running a record label, all the administrative managerial stuff. Which was a lot. Which is a lot, right? Yeah. Especially when it's pre-internet, there's no automation, it's all just paperwork and whatever and a few emails. Mm. And then you've got to try and do that on Thursday and Friday, and then you jump on a train, you know, so it was really, we, I mean, I, I can speak for me, there was particularly a couple of members in the crew who were like a bit more organised and, uh, and smarter than I was, but I think looking, looking at the tools we've got now, and the people we had involved, I think we could have smashed it, like if we were still doing it now, but like yeah. I'm 46 now, and I'm like, I haven't got the energy, I'm glad I, I basically gave up DJ and sort of probably best part of 15 years ago now. We've still done other gigs, like we, Matt and I, uh, my DJ partner, we were quite big in southern Spain. Yeah, so it was like, a big, big scene out there, wasn't there it? There was like, big, yeah. big, big scene, yeah. yeah but it was big scene, the break. Yeah, but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't massively, didn't always enjoy those gigs. So we sometimes go and play to like five, 10,000 people at these big outdoor wow. raves. Nice. But they were like really heavy, really druggy crowds. Like, so it, it weren't always the nicest atmosphere. Yeah. Um, you kind of get, like, big rave, and then you see a fight breaking out in a corner, and you're oh, like... Really? Wow. Yeah, it was, it was all a bit, uh, a bit nasty in terms of, like, it was just very, very... I, think, I don't know just whether it was just uh, drugs or, or whatever, yeah. but it was just, like, a quite an aggressive vibe. Like, everyone was really up for it, yeah. but it was, like, it was always, like, a, a, a thin line away from things going nasty. Bit of an edge, like, yeah. Yeah, always yeah. a bit of an edge. Um, but... Yeah, we so anyway, so Matt and I still get one or two requests every year to go over and do gigs out there. Yeah, things it's like five hundred euros, and you're like, that's fine. They'll put, but you you're on an easy jet flight at six a.m. from Luton. Yeah, then you stay in some sort of travel Spanish travel lodge, and but you get three hours sleep, and then you come back, and because you're forty six, you're like <laughs> you're you're absolutely useless for three or four <laughs> days. <laughs> you know, so it's like, and then by the time you spent money on pizza and whatever and just expenses to get to the airport get back and while you're out there yeah. you've come back with like 80 quid each and you're like uh, a lot of hassle for yeah them, it's <laughs> like you know you'd only do it for the giggle so if they said look come out and spend three days you know chill out by the pool for a couple of days afterwards totally in for it but you're like you're out on the 6 a.m flight you're flying back three hours after your set finishes at 4 a.m and you're yeah. just like it's you yeah, know it's i'm not much, i'm not trying to build a career anymore i'm not doing this yeah. for the for the views so um yeah, so that was uh, that was it was it was great fun, but like in your twenties, it's fine. But yeah, so uh, we so, so at this age now, then obviously that was quite a while back. Where are you at these days? Are you, are you still involved in the creative side of? Yeah, I mean, I, I, after the after the label, I spent a couple of years sort of doing various bits and stuff around the creative industries, like helping governments and councils like build the creative industries, particularly around Wales and, and Cardiff, just like how to engage with them because it less so now, but certainly back then they didn't really have the mechanisms to speak to creative people. Like you had like the Welsh government policy, but like then there's all these people doing the stuff down here, and they didn't know how to communicate. Okay. So and I was, coordinate between the two. Yeah, and yeah. like speak the same language, and just yeah. like 
you know, and just so they put these schemes together that didn't weren't particularly relevant, but they thought they were, you know. So I was doing a bit of that, trying to be an intermediary, and then uh, I've been running my own business for a while. Well, for probably ten years now, which is like a, a merchandise service in the music industry, and uh, we've got another couple of bits and pieces that we do. Basically, we're a technology business that facilitates people being able to print T-shirts or hoodies or whatever. Do you want to give a shout out to what, what the yeah, so like Dizzy Jam is the main one for probably for more of your your sort of viewers and stuff. Dizzy yeah. Jam. So that's that's with Dad. With yeah. Dad from Spillers, right? Yeah, so Dad yeah. from Spillers. Yeah, he's uh, he's I've my seen business him for a partner. Long time, like. He's all right. He's probably uh, he's probably sweating over the fact his emails don't work right at this very <laughs> minute. So you know, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, Dad. Dad is my business partner, and we got another guy who worked with in Bulgaria, which is why I ended up moving to Bulgaria for a couple of years. Oh, right. it like, it's great, man. Yes, yeah, it's, it's great. And like, it's it's different. It's difficult at times. It's not not always perfect I mean see you know it's like it's only like 20 years outside of uh, the sort of um, I suppose post communism or whatever so they're in the EU and they're you know it's a fr- but I often think it's a bit like Wales insofar as it's like you've got a couple of cities where stuff is happening yeah and then the rest is all like fields and dragons. Okay. Like it's literally, there's like you know, there's a couple literally. Whereas England is quite dense in terms of like you can't really go more than like 20, 30 miles without finding a city yeah. or a big town. Can't do that in Bulgaria. And same with Wales. Like you know, you've yeah. got you got we've you know so in in Bulgaria you've got like Sofia and Plovdiv, sort of over here. And then over here you've got like Varna and Burgas, which are like the cities on the coast. But in between there's like there's Definitely. nothing going on. Yeah. Like there's a couple of towns and. It's the fastest shrinking population in fastest the world. Fastest shrinking, really? Yeah, because I think it's... I suppose it's not, again, it's not dissimilar to Wales. Like, if you are... if you, it's, Let's say you grew up in McCuntleth, right? Or just somewhere in the middle of Wales. And same as in Bulgaria. You're 19 years old. You've got something about you. You want to make a change in the world. You want to do something with your life. You want to do something creative, something interesting, something energetic. You've got two choices. You either move to Cardiff or Swansea... Or you get out, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, I think it's very much the same in Bulgaria. You're like you move to Sofia or Plovdiv, yeah. or you move because you're in the EU. They're like the first first generation who can go. Well, I can move to Germany, yeah. and so a lot of them actually do. Mm. Whereas actually, like here, if you spoke to the average like graduate, like oh, where do you study? It'll be like <coughs> Birmingham or Bristol or London or Manchester. Yeah. Like the average one out there, they'd be oh yeah, I studied in uh, Munich right. or Paris yeah. or you know. A, big big percentage studied overseas because they can yeah they all speak great english like the younger generation so they're like you know i'm getting out yeah you know so it's a very smart young bunch of people there but it does have its problems it's still a very sort of there's still a lot of corruption there there's still a lot of kind of uh still kind of run by the mafia to a to a great extent although as a as an immigrant you kind of float blow that you don't really see it yeah like you know, so uh, but yeah. those people who are affected by it day to day, who've lived there for their whole lives, yeah. then they do they are really affected by it. So, so it uh, must be quite tough for the the villages in between the cities, and they're they're probably getting affected quite badly. Yeah, because everyone leaving. Yeah, guess, right. So you've got no young blood staying. Yeah, like no. all the young blood is leaving, right? And it's, it's you know I'm sure it, it, there's a certain amount of it, it happens in the rest, Western Europe as well. Like it's a agglomeration of like we've now got people more people living in cities than we have in outside of cities, which first time in human history that's ever happened, right? Because obviously, same thing happens here. You grow up in McCuntleth, yeah. I'm going to Cardiff, right? Yeah. right? Or to London, or to Paris, or wherever, Like, because yeah. I can't do what I want to do in McCuntleth. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the McCuntleth Comedy Festival, I think, is a is a big success. But apart from yeah, that, it's I don't great, think... Actually, you know, yeah, it's great, actually. I love that weekend. Yeah. It's, uh, but there's not a lot else going on, you know, oh. in terms of, uh, you know, so... So, well, so Bulgaria is kind of a, an odd place, but it's very beautiful. People are lovely. Loved it there for a couple of years. It's uh, it's great. Nice man. And on that note, um, obviously people leaving the country to come to the cities. Is that what you done? Are your roots in the countryside, or are you a city boy? No, well, I grew up in. Well, I grew up in the first ten years of my life. I I'm from Coventry. Ah, Co- yeah, Coventry. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just just down the road from um, from Ninge in terms of like where I grew up. Ah, right. Um, but Coventry in the seventies was a weird place well the, the specials ghost town song is, is written about coventry is it really? yeah yeah the actual oh, well. coventry is in the video yeah. if you watch i think my, my i did remix it recently so i didn't even oh really know. yeah, yeah it's, I didn't it's, know it was coventry, yes, it's apparently it's about coventry oh right because like, they're all from that area all that uh, two-tone movement's coventry right um and then so i grew up in inner city coventry so that was really weird so i went to a super mixed primary school like 
say maybe 30% whites, like the rest were like Asian kids, Afro-Caribbean kids, it was amazing. Then my parents moved to the countryside to Gloucestershire, which is where I spent like my formative years, from, like 10 to 18. Yeah. I went to a boys' grammar school, 800 boys, one black kid, one Chinese kid. <laughs> <laughs> my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So like, my gosh. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, or maybe, they're t- I don't know, but anyway, but the point being is like, it was, um, it was a bit of a, uh, <laughs> A, a reverse culture shock for me because I come from like inner city Coventry to like you know so it's a bit of a so I, I, so yeah so I grew up in the countryside basically the, you know when I was independent my parents I was like running off around fields so but I do love cities like I love spending time in the countryside I think like you I like I love getting out walking into the hills into the mountains but fundamentally I've got to be near a museum a cinema and a good coffee you know, on a regular basis, yeah. you know, something to stimulate me. Yeah. Um, so I think my ideal would be to, um, you know, if I just had no no limits on my resources, I'd go and spend one week every month in the middle of nowhere and then come back and go, right, you know. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because um, what I noticed as well, yeah, is like what you're saying about Bulgaria and, and other places which outside the city, where outside the city or in their own circle yeah um yeah when you're young you want to get things done in it you know and you if you stay out there all the time you 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 could lose the oomph yeah yeah easily and i think that's the biggest threat to youth as well you know is when there's you know nothing going on we we make something happen whether it's good or whether it's bad or however anyone sees it we 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 want to participate Mm -hmm. and and we want to do something and to me, it's about celebration, really. Yeah. Life's about celebration. And I think it's, you know, you see it, you see it with careers as well. You know, we look, we'll all have friends from school or whatever who we know at the age of 20 or 21 or whatever, they fell into a career and 20 years later, they're still in it. They're not passionate about it. They don't love it. It's just what they got used to. I think that's why you kind of have that typical midlife crisis thing, right? It's just like uh, people get to 40, 45 and they're like, oh, shit, I spent 20 years behind a desk and do I, do I want to keep doing this for the rest of my life? And uh, yeah, so I think, I, I don't know, it's, uh, I think maybe you're right, if you stay in the city, uh, stay in the countryside, past like 25, you know, I've still got lots of friends who still, you know, Stroud is the small town that I kind of grew up in. Oh, Stroud, is it? Yeah, Stroud's oh, lovely, right. it's like oh, a real okay, yeah. little, it's a weird hippie town, it's yes, like, yeah. you know, you go to the, sit in a cafe there, and like the person next to you might be the founder of Extinction Rebellion, <laughs> And the next person's a traveller, and then the next person owns like half of Gloucestershire and is related <laughs> to royalty. It's like there's a real mix of mix. really, really. There's lots of landed gentry there, like lots of people who kind of uh, own really significant parts of land and come from massive, like rich families. And then you've got like a big old hippie community, just like really. Uh, I think Extinction Rebellion founders actually live oh, there. Yeah. Okay, right, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a great town. I do love it, but yeah, I couldn't uh, I couldn't personally have stayed there. But you know, I've got lots of friends who stayed there, and they seem happy and whatever. But it's just like small town life is. I'd rather go the whole hog and just like move into the literally the middle of nowhere. Yeah, than, yeah. Uh, you know. And uh, could I ask as well? You obviously had to work with the government to help yeah. connect with the, the 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 creative people of Cardiff. Did you after that? Did, did you set up other businesses then? I, I know there's some stuff with you doing some sort of talks and um, events. Yes. Was that your new business from yeah, there? Yeah, no, a lot of that stuff was just voluntary, just because oh, I it? wanted that stuff to happen. Like stuff like TEDx Cardiff yes. and Ignite Cardiff were two events that I set up right. uh, with my friend Claire. In fact, we've since handed them on to different teams because we don't really have the time to run them anymore. And again, we never sort of earned any money from them. They were a bit of a, a, a sort of. A, a sort of a voluntary venture really but yeah they were great they were like it was just a sense of like trying to bring people in the creative and perhaps a little bit in the digital communities together you know it's like for me it felt like networking was just like a bunch of fat guys in suits right and you know if you were like and I was turning up like a bit like this thinking yeah. you know I'm not like I'm not a super scruffy but I've got a hoodie and jeans on right so they were like uh looking at me a little bit and I was I was 30 I was pretty self-confident but even I felt a bit kind of intimidated so I just started running these events with my friend Claire to just bring people who were designers, creatives, musicians, an opportunity to be in the same space together. They didn't necessarily want to network because none of us are like the kind of business card swapping types. 
but we did want to be in the same space together, listening to interesting ideas, getting inspired, and just have the opportunity to meet someone interesting at the bar or, you know, have a conversation with someone, oh, I should introduce you to so-and-so, and just that, you know, you get that accelerated serendipity, like when you get, like, some interesting people in a room, you just, like, sometimes you bump into someone, oh, no way, do you do that? Oh, we should chat, and, you know, collaborations happen, and, yeah, we've heard of all sorts of things happen off the back of our events that were just, like, really inspiring, and it was just, it was just nice just to bring people to the same place and just give them an opportunity to talk you know the, the, the kind of the, the talks that were presented were almost just an excuse to get them in the same room together, it was like yeah. you know yeah. bringing people together yeah that is the uh, you know creative people my uh, my friend Rob uh, he asked me to facilitate this event between like creatives and uh, technical people and like you have to, we had to find a way to get them to work together because they speak quite difficult l different languages you know you've got your super creative people but then you've got your super like technical people and they kind of don't communicate in the same language a lot of the time so I had to run this event to try and help them work together and whatever and he said to me um, he said if this wasn't government money I'd just lock them all in a room with a load of beer and leave them for 24 <laughs> hours and he said but it's government money that's running this project so I can't do that he said so oh. I'm paying you to be the beer <laughs> And I was like, I've always thought of that as a, like a little bit of a mantra. <laughs> be the beer. Like, how be the can beer. You, how can you make people? Because beer brings people together, right? It makes people talk to each other. It makes people more friendly. I mean, it has some downsides as well. But like, yes. in the right circumstances, <laughs> it, it kind of like it, it kind of um, it has the right um, the right ways of making people communicate. The social lubrication. S yeah. yeah. Exactly that. Social so, oil. so that's social you. Oil. You, are, yes. you are the social Yeah, so like, like <laughs> you use that, how can I be the beer? So that's always <laughs> been a bit of a mantra for me, like be the beer, be the yes. beer, how can I do that? So it's all about connecting people then, really? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Ah, so it seems to be like a theme of like collaboration running through your life, really, with your early work. You said it was mm. a small posse of your friends, yeah. and now you're trying to facilitate that connection of people. Um, since those meetings and events, have you done anything since then that's different, or has it mainly been that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I do. I, 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 at the moment, I do a lot of startup mentoring. Oh. So actually, uh, I've been doing that for a couple of years. But when lockdown started, I was like, "Well, I'm going to be sat looking at my laptop for 23 hours a day, yeah. locked in my flat." So um, I started offering free mentoring, uh, which I've been doing for years anyway. But like, I had a very structured approach to it. Like, I did one a day. All through a, all the way through the pandemic, basically. So I've done like over a hundred mentoring, and it started with just people in Cardiff, and then it spread, and like people started to find out about it. Brilliant. So I've done people in India, Australia, America, whatever, and I've had some amazing feedback from people who were like early stage entrepreneurs who were just like, I think sometimes you're you're so full of energy that you can't clarify. Like a mentor is not there to tell you what to do, but if they're good, like a good therapist, they'll just help you like narrow your focus you're ah so this is a thing i've got to work on you know so um that's been really really uh rewarding i've really enjoyed doing that brilliant and coming back to that thing you're saying about that sort of trend of bringing people together yeah. i noticed that a couple of years ago as well i was like holy shit that's something i've always done like and i've never got paid for it most of the time it's like i just do it because i love it so i've actually i'm actually halfway through writing a book about building community well and um, bringing and bringing coconuts together yeah. when you bring coconuts yeah together and they start to communicate and it goes very well and you as the organizer how do you feel oh it's great i mean it's, it's lovely i mean you know everyone loves coconuts right so uh, i was wondering where you were going with that metaphor but yeah like you know i totally the head. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was thinking the end of the metaphor. The yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Fuel in the cabbage, the cabbage fueler. <laughs> Daddy Kaka, the, no, cab the cabbage fueler. <laughs> the cabbage connector. The cabbage connector. Yeah, yeah. the castle on top of top. <laughs> no, man, it's it's great. It's it's I I yeah, it's really like putting on a good event and you see people walk out there energized and enthusiastic and talking to people, talking to people they never met before. That's a really good feeling, you know. It's like anything you do. When you do a good job and you see that people enjoyed it, but, you know, after doing it for years and years and, you know, you kind of like, it gets bigger and bigger. Like the problem we had with TEDx Cardiff was it got to the point where the last one we did was in the tram shed live venue. Yeah. So we we had four or 500 people ticket uh, seats in there 
and it sold out in something like two minutes. What? Oh, wow. So the expectation gets Ooh. really silly. Yeah. yeah. And we're like, we never told anyone this is like the best thing since sliced bread. It just kind of the expectation builds. We did a good job and people like the talks are really good. So we had to, uh, yeah, we had to sort of find, we, it, it just, the expectation just got too big for us. And we were just like, you know what? We're not getting paid for this. It like sucks up like four or five months of our year. It's really stressful, you know, you kind of, the expectation for it to be like super slick, yeah. super amazing. You know, we get people, we got people coming to the first one ever, but they'd heard like all this vibe about it. And we were like, we didn't tell you, we, how we got, we got to live up to that. Yeah. Like it was all yeah. like those people who've been with us since day one. And they're like, yeah, we've seen you grow. We understand what you're trying to do. Yeah. But these people coming for the first time, they'd seen all these TED talks online and they were like, oh, it's going to be like that. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. We like this little voluntary outfit in Cardiff. Right? Yeah. So you've got to. You're on a journey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Slowly getting there. Slowly getting there. So facilitating people's expectations. Mm. Yeah. Was that the difficult part? Was that what, what made you. Um, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes I think a step backwards and, and take another look at it. I think yeah, just sometimes your your energy for stuff like you guys will know this. You'll have worked on projects for years. Like you, you know, you've both been guys who collaborate, produce. You're both creative people. You're constantly putting out stuff. But there comes a point where and your enthusiasm alone isn't enough no. to sustain you. And it's like okay, yeah. I've got to get some reward back and like. If you're getting paid like lots of money, then that's one form of reward. Or if you're seeing that people are totally engaging with it, and every year like more people are engaging with it, more people are engaging with it, more people are engaging with it, and it brings you other opportunities and whatever. But when it kind of hits a little bit of a plateau, and you're like, you either don't see your YouTube counts go up, or you don't see your bank balance rise, or you don't see like the number of emails offering you gigs come in get go up. Yeah. When you've done like eighteen months, two years, five years of that, and you're like, I'm not. Like, unless you love the process yourself so much that you do it anyway and you're not doing it for out external validation, which we all do f to some extent, but eventually you're like, I'm a bit knackered. Yeah. I'm a bit tired of doing this, right? And, yeah. you know, we all go, I think most creative people go through that process, don't they? And they yeah. just, you know, sometimes you just have to go, taking six months off or it's going to take a step back you know like you say and it's there's all these different parts of it some of it's the promotion some of it's the production like you say some of it's just bringing people to the table to discuss stuff with you because yeah. it's like you yeah. know you guys have worked on collaboration stuff and you're like just getting the other five people involved <laughs> to be in the same room at the same time yeah herding cats right Absolutely, so yeah. so yeah. yeah it all takes a lot of emotional and physical and psychic energy you know so yeah okay i've got a, yeah. another question i'll ask you it's, um it seems to be like you're very involved in like the processes of creativity. Mm. What about the actual act of creativity? Are, are you a, are you creative yourself? You know, do, do you make things? Were you a producer <sighs> back with the label? Or yeah, um, that's a really interesting question because I would never consider myself a traditionally creative person. Like I'm not an artist. I don't draw. I don't write. Or I do write, but I don't paint. But I think we have a bit of a stereotypical. Um, thing about creativity don't we like we kind of assume it's somebody who writes or, or uh, yes. creates music or you know that's what a creative is but I think all of us are creative it's just like we haven't found what our creativity is most of us like because society doesn't necessarily allow us it could be like a woodworker or it could be someone who makes these or yeah. you know it could be a, a clothes designer or whatever but I think m m society generally doesn't allow us to acknowledge the other things that are creative. And I think, you know, yeah. creating events and bringing people together is a form of expression Absolutely, and creativity, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, of Your course. Art of project management. The right. Get, getting the, the picture, of yeah. the, the whole thing, to, so all the collaboration can uh, be effective. Yeah. So everybody can get something out of that event. I think anything yeah. that express that gives people some kind of emotional response and gives you a an outlet is a creative thing right Spot yeah, on. because uh, because i think the biggest the biggest knife cut in in britain even from we being educated at school is that you should stick to one thing you must yeah. do this or do that you can't be yeah there's this fear of uh, someone who does more than one thing yeah you know i think for our generation definitely i think kids now it's, it's better like I think they're allowed because you know most kids now will probably have three, four careers. Like, but we were being educated for like 
one career you'll go on to become a a designer or an engineer or a, someone in sales or whatever but like I think kids now are like kind of expecting to like every five ten years just ch 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 or do multiple things like this portfolio career like you know because yeah. you guys as creatives would have done that as well you don't make your money from like one thing right you no. just kind of it's you know you're just doing bits and pieces and you know so I think but I think more people younger people will be more like that because also industries don't aren't going to last for like a hundred years anymore like you know 50 years ago our parents could be pretty sure that the thing they were doing today yeah was still going to exist in 50 years like, I've no idea whether Spotify let's say I make all my money from Spotify I've no idea whether Spotify or streaming in fact is going to exist in well that's it 20 you, years YouTube's right? down today isn't it, it yeah, well, it's, 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 yeah exactly <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> exactly <laughs> Google might have just pulled the plug you know yeah, so yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> And uh, do you have any sort of advice for sort of young people who are creative and maybe in Wales and they're, they're, mm. they're just passionate. working? Yeah, passionate. They're working at their stuff, but they're not getting much success. I mean, could you point to any? Because obviously you've had some success yourself. Could you? Uh, yeah, I think I don't know. It, it's some. I think it's really difficult to to give advice on creative stuff because it's all so personal and it's all totally dependent on the kind of thing you're doing. But I suppose the one thing that I can take, so a lot of what I do with businesses is help them understand their audience, right. or at least, because I think a lot of businesses that get set up, they don't, they don't really solve a problem for their customers. They think they solve a problem, but they, they've got an idea, but it's not necessarily a good business. And ultimately, unless you're solving a problem that's big enough that people are willing to pay you for it, yeah. then it's not, you know, like you, you can solve a problem. The, the example I always give is like, um, how many times have you spilled a drink in your life? Like hundreds, right? So it, yeah. it's a problem that everybody has. Yes. But nobody's going to pay to buy a permanent one of these that they can put on the top of every mug at home or every wine glass because it's not a big enough problem for it to be... Like, it's it's a big enough problem when you're kind of walking around the street, yeah. but at home you're not going to do it. So you accept that you're going to spill the occasional glass of water, cup of coffee, whatever, yeah. because it's just not a big enough problem. So I suppose in terms of the creative side of that, it's like, just know your audience just know what they want from you what is yeah. it about you that they connect with because it could be your music but it could be like I don't know particularly with stuff like punk or sort of more left field music people might not care about the music let's be honest Sex Pistols weren't musically it, it they connected with the energy with the message yeah and the Sex Pistols for example is the proto kind of punk like that's what pe that's what got people excited. Oh yeah. So it wasn't the music, you know, and it wasn't like so it, it, a, a kind of dumb music executive could listen to that and gone, ah, musically it's a bit crap. Yeah. So we're not going to engage with it. But actually, a good music executive would have gone, no, I understand the energy. And it's like saying we like uh, bands like Idols and Sleaford Mods now. Yes, yeah. You know, when I first saw them, when I first listened to them on radio, I heard them on Six Music or something. I was like, ah, yeah. I mean, I've never been a particular big sort of punk or new wave kind of guy. And I was like, oh, yeah, kind of all right. Yeah, I get it. And then I saw Idols do a Tiny Desk concert. Have you seen those Tiny Desk? Like, they're like these, these little online uh, gigs they do yeah. uh, from the NPR offices in New York, I think. And I was just like, the yeah. energy it's coming off those guys was yeah. just like, oh, I get it. Like, once I saw the energy yeah. and understood the message and listened to the lyrics, I was like, ah, oh, right, I get it. Yeah. And then I went to see them live uh, at Green Man last year. Yeah, they're like an explosion, aren't they? Oh, yeah, it's infectious. Just insane. Yeah. yeah, and I was just... Um, so I think find the thing that... And, you know, idols are good musicians. It's good music, and I'm not, you know... But that's as much about the energy as it is about anything else, you know, about Absolutely. the message, and just have an angry... One thing that I think is really good is to have an angry, energetic voice an expression for disenfranchised white boys because they are being hoovered up by the far right at the moment right. which i think is really scary like if you're like i see it with people i know people in my family they're disaffected they're frustrated they you know uh, for whatever reason they can't they've got no work or you know they and, and the far right are going yeah we'll have you here get some of those youtubes down your neck <laughs> we'll 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 suck you up with our with our message and you'll we'll slowly coax you in and then before you know it they're kind of marching for Tommy Robinson yeah I was going no 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 you can still be angry and still want to change shit yeah and still want to make things better 
but you but use your energy in the right way. Yes. And so that's what I saw like when I watched them live and when I saw them at Green Man. It was just like that same kind of angry kind of let's change things, but it wasn't. But it was for all the right things, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and that that for me was what really hit me here. You know. I've got you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the good things about punk music and people at like Sleaford Modern Idols and whatever these guys who are kind of overground sort of become quite popular. It's like ah right. No, we can get we can get that message home to them in the right way. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So without that outlet, it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because there are yeah, extreme because organisations. There are. Yeah. Like, and that's I I, yeah. I see it happening, and it's mm. it scares me. One of the things that really scares me, you know, I I fucking hell, I'm like, I'm sit on a massive pillow of privilege. I'm like a straight middle class white boy. It's like it's like nothing could be easier for me. Like in terms of. But I'm really, really scared by the far right. You know, you've got like climate change and COVID and all these bad things happening. But like, there are Nazis marching in the streets. And we didn't think we'd see that again. Uh, certainly our grandparents didn't think they'd see that again. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, it's a thing that uh, is inevitable to happen because it's like, just like nature, nature now is building up all this poison and everything because she's trying to preserve herself it's about preservation anytime any group of animals feel that they're under attack right or something different is coming in to change them then they will actually protect their territory they become territorial yeah like territorial army or terri territorial um, I've had a privilege of mixing in so many different groups you know, because I, I got uh, the genes of this group, the genes of that group. So it's like something in me has pulled me into different groups. And the thing is, it's like a fraction, right? There's many understandings. There's many ways to do things. But like, you know, with maths, there's only one answer. Yeah. And unity only comes about when everybody can accept that we live in a world that is beautiful, a lovely flower bed, it's beautiful, but what we have to watch out for is the weeds, and the weeds will kill all the flowers. So that's the bad thinking. Mm. Anytime you need a checkup from the neck up, yeah? <laughs> so the way we wash our bodies, we need a mango wash. Hitler was, was uh, the Martin Luther King of, of the West. But what Hitler focused on is the fear of the people. The fear of the people, or promoting fear, brings people together. Like love brings people together. What people love brings people together. What people hate brings people together. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the thing about it is, is, if everything was put back the way it was, the way with the way Mother Nature had created it and put back the way it was, then would we still have? All yeah, all this uh, confusion and things like that. Probably we would. Yeah. So. But well, there's a tribal nature to to us as well, right? We you know it's part of our genes to a certain degree to. No, I don't think it is. I, I think it's the mind. We're all living in the same mind, right? And the mind. Yeah, the mind, as an enemy. And that's when you put yourself, above everything else. Yeah, when you realise that we, yeah, that we're all on one earth, yeah, and we're supposed to be here. It's a miracle that we we're, we're here. If you look through all the processes that we we come through mm -hmm. biologically and how we've evolved, you know, but when people start to get lazy in their thinking, right, and this that the other, they just act on instinct, and instinct is if there's anything that's different, you attack it. Yeah. So it's it's a time of the scapegoat, that's why the goat is at the top of the mountain. Used to be the lamb, we accepted what the lamb was. We, yeah, we accepted what the lamb was, but now it's a time of the goat. So horns are getting sharpened. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. I've got a uh, butt in there because we're almost out of time. Wow. But uh, yeah, some nice words, Ninja. Always a bit of wisdom from me every week. Always. <laughs> it's a um, we're going <laughs> to ask uh, Neil maybe a closing question. Do you want to do that or shall I? You do it this time. So, I, I haven't got one yet. I'll have to think of one. <laughs> <laughs> now you have. <laughs> so, Neil, uh, any closing words, mate? Anything you want to share with us? 
about the creative uh, industries or the creative process or Wales in general or just yourself any closing words for us buddy no not really I mean what you know just thank you to you guys uh, for you know I've we've moved in kind of not quite connecting circles or yeah. similar circles yeah. for like 20 plus years right yeah. and it's uh, you guys are still out there putting a lot of effort and time into doing good things and spreading the message and being creative and putting Cardiff on the map and it's um, it's appreciated you know it's uh, I think I think the problem is sadly that people generally tend to get recognized when they have a very clear economic impact <coughs> excuse me so and so I think a lot of the people in the creative scene especially those who are doing stuff like constantly doing positive stuff unless they go massive or get like the press coverage or get loads of money they don't really truly get recognized within their own kind of communities so um so no I know that you guys will probably go massively unrecognized in terms of your output uh, so yeah, just just thank you to you guys and, and keep doing it, man. It's appreciated. Excellent. And you're still doing the mentorship now. Are you? Yeah, yeah. If, if anyone's interested, just go on to uh, neilcocker.com and uh, you can find your way into some. Uh, we might if... get on ourselves uh, after <laughs> yeah. twenty years. We could do it yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any, any closing words? And then any, anything else, Neil? Anything else you want to say? Yeah, um, it's, it's in our case. In my case, it's not about uh, the recognition because that's already occurred. But even in India and all these different places, it's, it's mad. You don't know. It's like when you have a shit, right? Once you release it in the toilet system, you ain't got no control. Yeah, yes, yeah. It. <laughs> you go down the road to go and dig it up, they'll arrest you and do you for criminal damage. Yeah. Yeah? The only time you have control is while it's in your ass as soon as you let it go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anything can happen. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. Open yeah. your sink with the dishes downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we take a lot for granted, and we don't realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, is a cosmic reunion. I was talking to Flaps about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, nothing goes to waste. To Mother Nature, she'll find something to do with us. We're all just stardust. Yeah. Stardust, baby. Stardust. Stardust. On that note. On Tav of Tan. Stardust. Tan. So thanks for tuning in. And thanks. we'll catch you next week. NeilCocker.com. Thank you, Neil. Neil Cocker. Thanks, thanks gents. See you, buddy. Cheers. Thank you. Legends. <laughs>